Greetings! Welcome to Terra Prime Live, the second annual Seven Form Symposium. We've got a great panel uh, uh, assembled for this thing. Vornok will be joining me here. He is on the way, He's just a little bit late. We've also got a couple of latecomers. Hopefully they'll jump in here as well. Um, we're going to be talking about the, the, the line, the blur, the two polarities of reality and fantasy, because that's really what we're all dealing with here. As we've said many, many times before, the one thing that links all of us is we're taking this, this thing that meant so much to us, so this, this fantasy thing, and we're trying to make it real. And the more reality we can infuse in that, the more real it becomes, the more imagination it stirs in us, and then we can even make that fantasy world grow. So we have got, again, a great panel here. We've got some of the leaders in the Saber community with us. We've also got a couple of our masters here. Um, looking forward to a great show. Let me introduce our panel here. Uh, first of all, uh, we've got our masters, uh, Craig Page and uh, Jared, Nero and Wilos, and here comes uh, Vornok here right now. Everybody, where is he? <laughs> There we go. Okay, everybody's here in time for the for Very the introductions. Right. Excellent. So, um, yes, we've got. Uh, so we know we know them, but also on the panel we've got probably, arguably, the guy who we kind of all owe a lot of this a lot of the de debt to here. The guy who started New York Jedi, arguably. Well, not arguably the the <laughs> premier saber group out there, Flynn Michael. How you doing, Flynn? Greetings, Jeff. Thanks so much for inviting. This is great. It's uh, it's an honor. Thank you so much for that introduction. That was really that was fabulous. Thank you. No problem. No problem. And also another exciting guest here, another founder of of everything, the founder of the NCSCS system, the only complete. Uh, uh, Saber Combat system out there. You can get it on DVD at saber, sabercombat.com. You should know this name already. If you don't, I don't know what to tell you. We're going to try to rectify that here right now. Matthew Novastar Corrado. How you doing, Matthew? Oh. Oh, oh no, it needs me, but that's okay. <laughs> he what, what? Still, still muted. Still muted. Well, hopefully we'll get that sound thing. That's part of the fun of this whole thing, guys. Welcome, welcome tonight. <laughs> well, welcome to Google Plus Hangouts. And another guest that we've had on before, uh, leader of the Golden Gate Knights, uh, Alan Block. How you doing, Alan? Good. Thanks, Chad. Yeah. Sorry for being late. I had to run and grab on. And, uh, and, uh, That's so okay. That's Thank you so much. Yes, that seems to be that seems to be the theme tonight. So yeah, yeah. We're, we're all in the same boat on that one. Welcome, Alan. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. We're seeing a lot of uh, familiar faces out there. Yes, yeah. indeed, yeah. indeed. Am I not indeed. muted anymore? Aha! There we go. Yes. Matthew, how you doing, Matthew? I good. I don't know why it came up default muted, but that's probably a good idea because you know I'm talkative and all. <laughs> no. Well, we're hoping we're hoping we're gonna get lots of talkativity. Oh, yeah. Talkativity. Yes. Yes. Whatever. <laughs> hey, at one yeah. point though, uh, for everybody, everybody you got your, your audio, audio on the back. You can probably hear like echoing. echoing. If you're, if not, you're talking, not talking, make sure you, make sure you uh, mute, uh, mute your mute. microphone so all you hear is the audio, not everybody else's in between when we're talking. Just to point that out. Yeah, I'll yeah. try to do that. I don't know so if I'm here. capable. Here we go. Who's still picking us up? I think it's Matthews. What? What is this? Okay. Yes, there we go. All right. Well, we will continue to uh, <laughs> to, to move along on that. Um, hopefully that won't become too distracting. Um, any, any, yes, so anyway, uh, we'll start the conversation here with... Kind of just generally. Matt, you need to mute. <laughs> just generally talking about, again, that 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 reality and fantasy kind of interplay. Um, we can start out first by talking about maybe 
the different forms, like how we perform this kind of stuff. So like the combat, right? We get that a lot. This will work, this won't work, that's realistic, that's not realistic, I like the movies, I don't like the movies, whatever, right? So that would be more like what we're talking about with the forms and our different approaches to, to how we do it. We can also talk about a little bit about the weapon, the realities of, you know, well, we're not really using a plasma torch, and what would it really be like to use a plasma torch, that kind of thing. And then does it really matter? Um, all of that. And then hopefully we'll kind of wrap it up with uh, a discussion about how fantasy kind of affects reality more of in a philosophical way in a, in a more global way, right? Because what we're, we're all talking about here, we're talking about building community. The symposium is, is, is for that so that we can get this stuff out and we can share what we obviously, and which will become blatantly obvious here in a moment, we feel extremely passionate about. So that's a little overview of kind of how we're going to go things here. We'll start things out. I'll kind of throw throw out the uh, various things. Where did I put my? I had a list here a moment ago. I did. It has disappeared. No, nope, here it is. Okay. Yes, we are well organized. Indeed. Obviously. Indeed. Yes. So, okay. So with the forms, we've got one thing that we've been thinking about, and. Um, as, as we've talked about throughout the years in the shows, is there's different ways that you can look at reality as far as what you're doing when we're doing the saber combat, whether you're doing the seven forms from our videos, whether you're doing the NCS CS system, whether you're going with New York Jedi, whatever you're doing, there's this, this idea that we're, we're creating a fantasy, but it's in reality. We're actually doing it, and part of the thrill of that is we can feel the tactile kind of reality of it. And when we're talking about the reality of kind of martial arts and, and movement and that kind of thing, if we're talking about kind of martial arts, a reality, there's different kind of forms of reality. What's, rea what's a good reality for a sport of martial arts, say Olympic fencing, may not be, good, may not be the reality in a self-defense situation when you, you don't have those particular rules or or what have you. That's going to be also completely different than a military situation where you're on a battlefield and there's lots of chaos and there's multiple things happening all around you. All these things are different approaches, different things, and these things will kind of leak into the training. Um, so I wanted to kind of throw that out here because we've got lots of people and we actually forgot to introduce somebody here, a very, very important guest here. You go from Ludo Sport here because I wanted to open up everything here. Ludo Sport, in case you guys don't know, Hi. is the it's 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 essentially what we're trying to do. They've cre they've successfully created a sport with sabering, and they have schools all over Italy. Lot you know, hundreds yes. of students. In, yes. in many ways, it's is what we would like to eventually develop this into. Right, exactly. So it, it, it's a point of memory. So I apologize for leaving you out of there in all of the chaos of <laughs> the ensuing beginning show, but why Not don't we open up the discussion with you? You're from a background of Olympic fencing, correct? Yeah. Yes. Right, okay. So when you were doing with, with the Ludo sport, yes. how, how are you approaching that kind of, that, that kind of idea? Well, the first, I, I was one of the first uh, trainees of Ludo sport, and uh, the first time I, I went to a lesson to a, to a class, uh, I was very, very um, boo, <laughs> very doubtful of what I was, um, I was encountering, and I was very afraid of uh, something uh, more uh, choreographics and less uh, sports. I was looking for something more uh, next to uh, the fencing that I used to practice in my youth, and. Uh, I was uh, looking for something fun, something funny, something entertaining, and I think the mix of uh, Ludo, which means a play, and sport, uh, which means uh, sport, sure. uh, was the mix that uh, thrilled me. And I, um, I found a place uh, where uh, practically everybody can, can have a place. Uh, everybody can find uh, a way to practice lightsaber combat, our lightsaber combat, 
uh, in a way of a, of a fun, of an entertainment, uh, but with the, the chance to, uh, to have a sport with rules, uh, with safety, with uh, a respect of, uh, of each other and, and respect of, uh, of the system. And I think uh, uh, I have to, to thank uh, Matthew Novostar Corrodo for what he wrote down and uh, in, uh, in a few lines we, we had in a chat on Facebook uh, this afternoon when he wrote down a, uh, a distinction that I, I think is very, very clear, very, very important. The difference among uh, uh, four kind of approaches, uh, the sparring, uh, the real combat, uh, the sport combat, uh, and the choreographics. Uh, and I think it's very important to, to have this distinction very clear. And I think that every time you can uh, read on, uh, on our website, for instance, uh, about that Ludusport make uh, real fights, uh, is not really exactly, because we do sport fights. And sport fight is really different uh, from a real fight. Uh, we teach uh, to any one of our pupils that uh, you can come here and learn how to use a lightsaber in our way, but you cannot mm, take a lightsaber, mm, go out there and mm, use it, use it like, like a club or like a, something else. Okay, right. uh, it's, uh, there are different rules, different ways of, uh, of approach. And uh, the other difference is uh, from, uh, I think, every kind or maybe most of the, of the, uh, of the uh, different uh, uh, lightsaber uh, combat ways uh, uh, we can have uh, um, is that um, our way is a, a way uh, of sport. Uh, um, I, I'd like to, to make myself clear. Uh, if you if you pick uh, a movie of you know Three Musketeers uh, or Zorro or uh, uh, any kind of, um, of of movie with sword fencing. You can think that it's a way to to do fencing, but it's really different from the Olympic fencing, which is conceived to not harm, and and so it's not a real combat. The reality is made in a sports environment, which is really different from a different kind of approach you can have. Uh, you can uh, obviously think that how lightsaber could really uh, could really be uh, in a real combat. I have to completely agree with Ugo here too because of just all the background that I have also in fencing is that, uh, and I was explaining this a little bit to Chad yesterday when we were uh, having a private conversation just you know before to get used to the Google Hangouts, but that you go in with a completely different mindset when you're in a real fight if, if, you're, if you've ever been in one or something, and again most of that's not going to involve a sword uh, yes. in any sense of the word. And beyond that, that for example, if someone said, well, what about a boxing match? And you're like, well, you're still in a completely different mindset. You're going in, you probably know the guy, you know his family, you know the date of the fight, you know it's coming, and you're going in with this attitude that you're not going to die, um, and yes. it's not a surprise. So it's this sport environment, no matter what. Even if you say, okay, well, we're going to take it to the MMA level. People sometimes yeah. will. I'll have conversations with them, and they'll say, "Oh, MMA. That's that's the that's the stuff. That's the exact way it has to be, and it's the most realistic." And I'm like, "Well, there are still are conventional rules put onto MMA, just like there's conventional rules in fencing, just like there's conventional rules in kendo, and blah 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 blah." Yeah. And I think the best example of that when we were talking it was is the 30 second ground rule that they instituted because people just got bored with watching jujitsu guys tackle people and then just wait until they gassed. And, yeah. you know, so it's like, well, split them. So there are rules. And, again, I think one of the things we've, we've talked about, too, is in sport, part of it is to foster the competition, right? So we, we're handicapping each other in certain ways. We're not allowing certain moves and all that kind of stuff to in to engage us more to 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 make it a little bit more difficult to put a game increase, more increase the challenge at a at a level of complexity yeah so um, I can um, can I just jump in here for one second yes absolutely um, Matthew can no you, you can't Flynn <laughs> uh, Matthew can you dictate what were those four points what were those four levels that you were sharing with Ugo 
uh, before? Well, Ugo, uh, I think it's a pr not really a private message, but I sent something out to kind of everybody before we did this Google Hangout, but it's just kind of my thinking on it, and I think pretty much everybody would agree uh, to a certain extent, but I just try to think approaching combat in basic four main categories, which is you're going to come in for sparring. So sparring, again, would be, you know, there's no choreography. I just, Flynn is there, I'm there, ready, go. It's and there practical might be some reaction. rules uh, placed on that. That's, that's fine. Right. Then you have, like, um, choreography, which, of course, that's Flynn and me, and we're like, oh, yeah, you go here, I go this, we're going to do this, this interesting kind of thing. The third yeah. one would be actual combat where it's more like, okay, you know, what if you had a real sword? What if someone was trying to kill you, you know? And uh, I'm trying to remember what I had for the fourth one. What was the fourth one? I'm trying sparring, to remember. Sport, real, and choreography. Yeah, it was sparring, sport, real, and choreography. Right, okay, there you go. Oh, yeah, so then they're right, the sport version. So in any case, the idea is it's like for me when I'm approaching any kind of project, because, for example, you know, if someone said, hey, I want to learn about a lightsaber, I'm like, well, what do you mean? Do you mean you want to learn how to spar someone in a sport kind of environment? Do you want to have these different conventional rules where you're like, oh, well, you know, I don't like this idea of saber fencing with the parry, repost, and right of way. I want to do something hit and not be hit. Or they're like, no, I want to choreograph a cool fight scene that I can film with my buddies. So there's just kind of all those aspects that go into it, and, and clearly, you know, Ugo would understand that, you know, that, you know, there, there there's so many levels when people say, I want to learn how to use a lightsaber. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, thing I like about that is, is you distinctly identified the four categories that we're all involved with. I mean, Ugo, you're in the sport environment. Matthew, you're also a martial artist as well. So you've got a killer technique, I'm sure, behind all this dancing and prancing around that we all do. Craig, you're always researching the seven forms. Uh, Alan, you're also doing the choreography and such out there. But, you know, we're all tapping into all these ancient systems of real leverage work with a new unconventional weapon that doesn't exist anywhere except for in MIT apparently they just created a new lightsaber which is kind of scary but but the thing I like about this and, um, and several of you all know like many of us met through uh, Saber Wars uh, the community website that I've been working on for a number of years that's meant as a directory to find people in those four categories of your interest because you've got actors that want to learn this, you've got martial artists that don't want to wear a costume but they really want to learn how this weapon would work, right? So that's a really great definition of pretty much the, all the categories that we all fall in. That's nice. Thanks, Matt. And if I could um, chime in, I, I find that uh, it's like each system that he's talking about, each sort of expression, um, is a balance between three uh, particular things. One is safety, Two is excitement, and then three is practicality, right? So in choreography, safety is the, the, the number one thing uh, that you want to do, and excitement, right? You want people to be safe, you want it to be exciting. Now, are things practical? Not so much. You know, you're going to have flourishes, all these superfluous moves. Uh, but in perhaps in a sparring situation, you want to have practicality and safety, right? right. So people well, are true. wearing you know, the special gear, there are sort of rules of engagement that are applied also to make it safe and exciting. Or, well, you know, Alan, it's true to some extent that, you know, choreography is, you know, all fakery, but there's also a good point with it that it's still, um, how do you explain this? It still mirrors the reality. Like, a real head cut is still a real head cut, but, yeah, you've got some conventions on it to make it a little bit safer. Like, for example, and you, you know this because you've been my student for many years, and, you know, we co-founded Golden Gate Knights together, is when I attack the head, I attempt to miss the target by a four inches or three inches, and Ugo knows probably precisely what I mean. Um, yeah. And I do this above the target or to the side of the target, etc. However, when we really want to hit the target, we just go those four inches more that is required attempting to uh, beat the parry, and I don't mean beat like strike, I mean tempo, like being able to get there before the defense can stop the action. However, with the right training and control, folks like Ugo or myself, and, and pretty much anyone else who wants to learn a system, even my system, whatever, is that then you're purposely missing so that the sabers strike in the correct areas to make it give the illusion of combat 
not the reality of it. Um, and that to me is the most important thing. So I know what you're saying, Alan, when you're saying, you know, are any of these things truly practical? And it's true, most of them are kind of not. However, a head cut still a head cut. When you make a nice, quick, direct attack, it's about as realistic as it gets, but you've now just, I, you know, I, I just thought of something. You've taken the edge off. That's all you're well, doing. Well, At the last you second. You the control. Here's a, yeah. here's a famous, there's a famous choreographer, Lau Kar Lung, out of um, Hong Kong, um, who's done, you know, really, really great stuff. He did the 18 weapons of Kung Fu, you know, just, just these crazy, crazy things. And one of the things he... He's always talking about because he always brought in his real. He's from a from a very traditional Hunga background. Didn't he's he just pass away? Very, excuse me. Didn't he just pass away too, or am I wrong? I think so. Yeah. 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 That was no, a he was not doing well. But yeah, it was all over so, Facebook. I was really disappointed. But I'm sorry. Continue. Yeah. He, 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 he did so much, so, some of the greatest fights and everything like that, and he used traditional martial arts and he used them, you know, in traditional ways and stuff like that, and he was. He, he kind of eschewed a lot of the King Hu um, balletic um, uh, stuff like that in favor of that kind of stuff. Even though it's not what we would consider realistic, like a fight doesn't really look like that. But his, his quote was always, you know, you always have to put a little bit of, you know, if the, if the intention is not true, it's not going to play. Right, and I don't know the best translation for for what he said, but it's essentially if no, I'm not doing something perfect. real, I don't have an intent, which is not going to necessarily play out. I can tell when some when two people are doing something and not trying to hit if each you're other. Moving just for the sake of moving, as opposed to moving, but even even if it's just the the staged intent of providing some kind of striker action, it shows up as being something that. that's just moving. For moving. Yeah, that is, but what you just said is right, because that's another thing that I think is so important, and it, it, I know Flynn understands this because he's a competent performer, he's awesome at it, and he's not just a saber guy, he's, he's an actor, and you, you do, right? You have to be a performer where this intention, and we use that word as actors a lot, about what are your intentions, and again, it needs to carry to the audience. Your intention may not truly be to kill the other person because it's a stage performance, but you need to, again, give the illusion of that to the audience. And um, it, it, it can be as real a feeling of what it would really be like to try to want to kill someone. Like, when I want to do a fight scene, I like to have the intention that I do truly want to harm them. Although, again, I take the edge off because it's just an act. But I don't want it to come out as fakery. And I think that's exactly what, uh, Chad, you and it's, it's Matthew, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, but th like I'll that be is. Matthew, you can be Matthew today. Just, yeah. <laughs> what you just said was gold. That's all I can say is, Amen, brothers. That's gold. Intention is like so much of the the play. I want to bring it back a little bit on the scope, though. Um, it's like uh, when you're doing a performance. What's the reason for doing the performance? For to tell a story. Well, why are we telling a story? To share a moment of humanity, something that happened. Normally, when a fight happens or when war happens, it's terrible because there was a massacre. Well, what happened? Well, here, here was the story. And then enter the stage combat to retell the story of the terribleness that should never again occur. So why do we tell those stories? Because the young, they grow up. If you, if you were a kid in New York City here when 9-11 happened and you didn't really understand what was going on, you still didn't really affect you. But if you were a teenager and you see it now, you know what happened, but those younger kids don't, right? So you have to paint the face of the villain to show the kids this is what evil looks like. Darth Vader, you know, the Emperor, whatever, put, it, put that evil face on it. Matt, you're right. You, if you don't show them what evil looks like, what a killer looks like, the lesson for learning the forms of defense will go on deaf ears because you're not trying to really punch through. You know, like a master usually gets through to his student when he knocks him to the ground because the kid gets the point. Not like you're trying to hurt him, but this is what happens. You know? I totally agree. I mean, you know, Shakespeare would often mention, you know, that um, a fight scene is the highest form of uh, drama and, and uh, having uh, conflict. So, like, and this is just something I always remember from my acting teachers and everything else, and just drama in general, is that, 
you usually try to work out everything. You know, if uh, I'll just make up a guy, Bob. Bob and I have a problem, so we start talking about it and we work it. We get angry, we argue. There's more and more, and all this stuff. It's escalating. We can't fix it, and then fighting comes into it. That's that's the thing. So it's really the highest form of having conflict that is unresolved, and this is the only way to do it. And that leads into the reality of what you said about the real uh, world. And also just uh, 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 how plays and, and, and films and, and uh, uh, TV shows have these things going on. You know, it's all it's all about conflict. And you're absolutely right. The source is from actors and people, and and they have wants and needs and all these desires. And it's not just hey, let's show a whole bunch of cool moves. This will be awesome. You know, well, that's not bad, opera, right? but it doesn't have any drive behind it. Beijing Opera, that's, that's the reason why they did the theater was so that they could practice. All these beautiful martial arts moves from the Beijing Opera and, and the Tibetan monks and all these guys that come by, and you're like, wow, this is amazing. Okay, they can do all these tricks, but you get them into a real fight, they're going to lock you up and stop you. That's it. They just want to stop you. All this practice is so that their physicality can maintain. That was part of the reason why I'm back in the past, too. Thanks, sorry. Well, <laughs> I want to make a point here and get get uh, throw this back out to everybody, and um, when we because we started bringing in choreography and, and, and fights and stuff like that, and I'm I'm of the thing that fights don't necessarily have to be realistic; they just have to be believable. And to be believable, there's lots of things that you can do. One of the things you can do is you can add authentic pieces to a thing. So when you're going to do a particular type of move, even though maybe it would never happen in real life or whatever, you try to do that move in a way that seems legitimate, right? That, that, and when you're doing martial arts or you, or you do sparring, you do some of the flow dueling or some of the, you know, that kind of thing, that's a good place to, to, to draw inspiration from. So that's where a good uh, kind of meeting place for that fantasy reality thing kind of comes in um, because it gives you kind of fodder to help create those illusions to help um, you know just kind of sell what what you're doing as real even though it's not um, why don't we why don't we start with you Flynn what do you what do you think about that kind of idea well I mean I mean still training in the real to bring it to the stage well meaning meaning that um, Putting putting the more real, authentic type of stuff into these these fake choreographies, kind of enhances enhances them. Uh, well, I think it's absolutely. You, you just said the point. I mean, if you're trying to tell a story, um, okay, like if you're trying to tell a story of brutality, you need to show an example of that brutality. Like um, one of our guys over here, uh, Jesse Bar uh, Barnick. Uh, just studied with this uh, this guy who's he's really got like a, a very ancient system, and it's all based in physics. Um, there's no real force going on. He's not striking. He's not doing any of that. He's got the physics down. So the physics period across the board for anything we're doing in stage or in practical or in sparring or whatever, physics never lie ever. And when you're an observer of a scene happening, you're going to observe those physics, and it's going to make sense to you or not. You know, when we first started out and we saw the Karate Kid, we look back at those fights now and we say, okay, I would totally do something different. That is so stupid. Whatever. But it still got you in the dojo. So they didn't do any of these fantastic kicks and flips and whatever. Um, then Jackie Chan comes along, Bruce Lee comes along, introducing these greater techniques that we all get to now study and learn because now it's a new perspective on physics. I think, I think it should help tell the story. Um, the style, like if you look at Rob Roy, there's a favorite duel of mine is um, uh, Liam Neeson and um, Tim Roth. I, yes, yes, Tim Roth. And it's just yep. Tim Roth. I was just working on notating that. Oh, it's uh, Tim Roth is it's such sick. a prick. But that's part of the, sto the story. You want you want to see somebody get killed. Normally, you don't want to see somebody get killed. So that villain needs to come across to you to be like, you want to see me die because I'm torturing your hero. And you're always rooting for that underdog. So, you know, fancy moves. Let's say um, people have seen me do my saber toss. Like I'll do my flourishes and I'll toss it in the air and let it spin a couple of times and I'll catch it and I'll go right back in my flourish and do whatever. Yeah, it looks fabulous and whatever. Is it practical in a fight? By default, you would say no. However, 
if I'm in a confined space, now I can't do a full slash. I now have to do a plum blossom behind the back so I can get a full torque for a really hard hit. Now that flourish is useful. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. it's whatever you have in your toolbox, I guess is my best answer. Yeah, we, we talk about that all the yeah. time. And also, I'll talk, talk about what you said a moment ago about bringing bites of reality in to make the, right. the, the, the story. Rob Roy, in many ways, is a good example. It's, it's, a, uh, it's an example of kind of a historic transition of two, two cultures, um, closely related, but two very different historic styles of fighting. Yes, and I believe he does, I believe Tim Roth does a behind the back parry in that fight. Yes, he does. And yeah, he makes like an attack that he goes around the back mm -hmm. you know, and actually slashes um, Liam Neeson's belly as he makes a pass forward. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, right. I mean, if you ask my opinion on that kind of stuff from fencing or whatever, it's totally unrealistic, but it sure is cool. And also, remember, those kind of fancy moves, when they're plugged in, they show a, um, a level of expertise that the audience will appreciate even though people who know anything about sword work and it's all like, you know, they go, oh, gee, what is that realistic? You go, no, but it, when they do something that uh, unorthodox and cool, it sure makes them look like, oh, dude, he just owned him, ah, ha, ha. Like, that's, if you accomplish that, you got your intentions across as a director or choreographer that the audience is like, dang, that was ridiculous. He totally right. just did whatever he wanted. I got two different scenes that is a good example of those. Um, uh, Serenity, uh, the Firefly movie, and the Karate Kid. The Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi, he chops the top off the bottle. And you're like, uh, okay, got the point across because it shut everybody up, right? Including Mr. Miyagi. He's like, no, never done it before. But, you know, consummate artist. The agent in Serenity when he does those all flourish and, you know, he wants to be a badass and get that point across to you strictly because he wants to dance to intimidate, you know? Two different, completely, uh, completely two different uh, applications of the same kind of top concept of your consummate art. Are you flashing it or are, do you have it but you're not going to use it? And coming from a filmmaker's perspective too, as it, you know, because I, I do a lot behind the camera as directing and all that kind of stuff, I'll tell you one thing, those flourishes, all that kind of stuff, they're really, really nice because there's something that's peculiar about human beings. We can't watch two things at the same time. So, like, real fights look like chaos. They look like a mess because there's all kinds of stuff happening at the same time. and We can't kind of discern that. So when we choreograph something, we, we bring these things out so that they kind of highlight. So I know, for one thing, if I'm try, trying to do something, we have to get this character from there to over to here. But if he just kind of walks and chop, well, I think Jackie Chan said it. Jackie Chan said, nobody wants to see Jackie Chan walk through a door. They want to see him jump through the window, do a somersault, break a couple of dishes on the way. So That's a really good point, actually. I mean, what you said, Chad, which is, I mean, when we start talking about film, it, it is definitely is an, another animal. And like you I always think of it like another block to add into the equation. You're stacking all these these concepts. But... Yeah, with film, uh, almost all stage combat choreographers that I've, I've, I've worked with and even film guys that I've talked to or whatnot, um, I have the ability to talk to this one really cool guy who's in Hollywood and whatnot and has been in the business for a long time, and he just has his own kind of, like, group. But he's, he's also really accessible. He's amazing. But anyway, he uh, mentions about filling the space. That's something you always hear. Fill the time. Fill the space. And I'm sure you guys have all seen it where it's like a kung fu movie and there's the main two characters and they're, they're, they're sharing exchange. But if it's the whole one on 20 people, um, there's all those other people in the back and they don't just stand there looking like idiots. They do the, you know, the kung fu shuffle. They're moving around. They're filling the space. And I know it's silly, but it's like, I mean, although there's other techniques to do the whole one against many thing, they're filling the space and time. And you'll even notice that with, for example, if someone does a very fancy punching action that requires like um, them to you know, step body spin and etc. The other guy won't wait there and then block. They need to kind of make a lot of actions and then pow, actually finish the block by filling the space and time. And that's what fills all the gaps and whatnot. And to me, I maybe it's just my eyes, but when I watch fight scenes, I look for those things, and it bothers me when I see that the, um, the, the spaces are not filled. That's just me. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. Uh, Craig, you wanted to jump here, in here. 
Oh, you're okay. muted. <laughs> we cannot hear you, Craig. Nope, not yet. Uh, click that icon on your the lower part where you see your face. I had the same trouble with that. Do you see it? I don't know. <laughs> I was just learning Google Hangouts as well. Chad was educating me with it. <laughs> Did you find it, Craig? It should be like at your face. You just float over your face in a little microphone. Can you guys hear me? Yes, there we go. Oh, thank God. Sorry, it my Google app defaulted. Anyway, um, the key word in any any stage combat for any any form of medium is verisimilitude. It's the appearance that is real as far as that universe is concerned. Can you guys still hear me? Yep. Yeah, that was very well said. Keep going. Okay. We, we heard you, uh, but what was the word again that you just used? What was the word? Uh, verisimilitude. It's, all, it's, it's about 300 points in Scrabble. Um, <laughs> it's the illusion that this makes that despite whatever universe you exist in or are currently viewing, whether it be Star Wars, Serenity, uh, Kung, a Kung Fu epic, a Wu Sha film, you know, any, you know, that it has the appearance that it makes sense that this is in the universe that it is occupying. Um, so it doesn't have to be real, but uh, someone viewing it from at least a third person perspective should look at it and go, okay, that makes sense. You know, you can look at, you know, that's why the lightsabers work is because you're looking at a giant glowing sword and you're watching, you know, people go at it and you're, and you're kind of looking going, this makes absolute sense. After everything I have watched, this makes absolute sense, which is kind of why, if you notice, in the at least in the original trilogy, um, the lightsabers don't really come out until the very end. Because by then you fully established that this is now, this is the culmination act. This is the now. Now, <laughs> I don't want to curse on this video, but you know, things are about to get real, and that is, you know, that is the point of of any fight that happens for, for a for a stage or viewing, you know, um, audience. Is that things are now about to hit the fan, and this you know, is Craig, the just to, of, of the just story. Before. Just to really quickly riff off something you said, because I don't want to lose it, because you said something really important, is that whole, is the audience able to believe it and whatnot? And that's why also, by the way, that's why I really am a big stickler for the whole targets, attacks, and defenses. And even uh, Chad, and I, I, I don't know who else was saying this earlier, but um, that, you, oh, it was Chad, where you said they can only watch one thing at a time. That's why it's really difficult when you have actions that are in ambiguous areas they can't follow it. You'll see it with high-level martial arts, too, where you'll see the distinction of a punch going out in the block, the return coming back to an, a, a riposte, and maybe two more attacks, and etc. And sometimes, I'm sure you guys have noted, they'll use the camera to follow the action back and forth in between the exchanges to help accentuate who is currently making an attacking maneuver and who's making a defense. It's not to say that you don't lock up sometimes and have this sort of neutral you know, place, um, but just the fact that uh, uh, it happens to be more of a uh, focus on who is attacking and defending, it makes it really clear and believable, as opposed to if you're just meeting the sabers in one position, um, people will start to lose it because they can't follow what's going on. They're looking at it going, I'm not sure who's attacking, I'm not sure what is happening. What, what are they doing? Yeah. Absolutely. You, 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 and again, that goes along with intent. If you can't tell what the intent of the scene is, like uh, Flynn, you were, you were saying, if you want somebody to be a brute, they have to be a brute. They have to act like a brute. They have to move like a brute. Right? Another thing that, that's really important, and this would, this would go in for doing techniques and why you would train, is because whatever your character is supposed to be able to do, you should be able to do. You know, otherwise the kind of illusion is ruined. So otherwise, you hire a stuntman; they can look better than you. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> it's one of the drawbacks. <laughs> so true. One of the drawbacks having actors with without a lot of real experience in whatever fight f fighting style they're doing is it's really hard for them to sell the fight itself um, when you can see the actor. Well, now we can digitally put their face on the stuntman. Right, right. Uh, right. 
Well, right. one of our guys, one of our teachers here in New York, TJ Glenn, which I'm sure you guys all know who that is, uh, one of his primary lessons is show the audience your pain. Because if you're in anguish and you're attacking somebody, and show them your rage, that's your pain. If you're defending and you're wounded, Rob Roy, when he gets slashed, uh, uh, and his sword's getting heavy, show them your pain. That way, when the payoff oh. comes, when you kick the guy's butt, it's that much sweeter for the audience. And it's, it's interesting that human beings need that. Um, yeah. Actually, there's an example uh, in the Saber community, and Flynn and Alan, you guys know him because he's he was one of the court guys in New York Jedi, and now he's in Golden Gate, uh, Dave, Vicious. Um, you know, in New York Jedi, he played uh, Darth Vicious. Yep. He played Darth Vicious, and, uh, and if you've ever met the guy, he is the cuddliest teddy bear you've ever met in, in reality. Um, but when he played Darth Vicious, he played what all... I, if any of you are DC Comics fans, Doomsday. That is essentially what he played, and he sold it to the hilt. He was the only person that I've actually seen where he could actually swat with his bare hand a lightsaber blade, and because he played the beast perfectly, not a single member of the audience questioned him. Any other person, we all would have just looked at it and said, BS, no. Like, you could have put in any sort of storyline, you know, dialogue to hand wave anything. If you can't play it off, you, you're, you, then don't. It should not be in the fight. It has to, I, it has to come. I just want to quickly say, our man Dave that you're talking about, he was, he was there at San Diego Comic-Con with uh, Alan and myself, so I just wanted to say shout-out to him. Also, yeah. I wanted to say, Alan, shout-out really quick, is um, speaking of selling your reactions, I, I want to say, Alan, he's done a really great job when we did our, our fight for San Diego Comic-Con. Um, when I looked back at the footage, his selling of being kicked, because, you know, I kick him around and all that kind of junk. Um, and his falls. It, yeah, it, 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 he, really, he did a really good job. I'm, I'm proud of my, my student and co-founder. There you go. Yeah. Can't ask for that. The Darth Vader and thing was awesome. Hey, thank you. Is that yeah. I, I'm, just a, a, th a thought that I've been having as we've been having this conversation is the the overall topic here is is blending of fantasy and reality and we have we have a, we we talk a lot about the reality of martial arts that we bring to the lightsabers and this conversation has been all about uh, the the dominant topic so far has been choreography stage performance and selling fantasy as reality for the audience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think one of the I, I think it can be really boiled down from what I'm hearing from everybody is there's two two kind of goals that are divergent in choreography and combat. In combat, you want to hide what you're doing. In choreography, you want to show what you're doing. And so excellent points. It's not really that they're going to be too much different. It's just the way you do them. So um, it, like if we do this, I think it would be easy an easy thing here we can do this right and that's one thing or we can be like right and you know move around use the space all of that kind of thing and those things are two totally different things even though we didn't do too much different as far as <laughs> As far as like what we did to each other, we just click, click. That's about it. Um, Nick Gilliard would say that you danced a little better. <laughs> Here's sweet Nick. Uh. All right. Well, now here's another thing I want to kind of move on from from this thing. We can always always come back to it at, at the end here. But one of the other things that's really really important when we're talking about this stuff is the weapon itself, the lightsaber. And there's like reality and fantasy with that, um, which is also very very interesting. And as we get into it, um, another thing that I know that uh, Nova Star is in. As, as, as far as that is the sound fonts, which is part of another one of those layers of uh, uh, fantasy and reality that we that we kind of bring to this, and that's something that regular swords don't do. They don't make sound. They don't do anything like that. Now, do we really need to go there? Yeah, I have here a uh, a practice sword. This is just one of the sword analogs. You know, it's an older type fetter sword. I've cut the guards off to be a little bit more like mine, but um, this is an ancient, basically like an ancient weapon analog. How do we fight with 
with a sword and not kill each other in practice. Um, this 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 particular sword is is based off of fifteen uh, block block prints from fifteen hundreds in right. German fencing schools. It's the it's it's the it's the practice weapon of fifteen hundreds Germany and probably a lot of Europe. Right, and so. We've, we've taken this as a practice weapon here, too, because it allows us to do a lot of stuff that, you know, you know kind of in the, in the same vein. Now, of course, the idea of a lightsaber in-universe is that the beam is light. It's not, it doesn't really have weight, although we've always made the argument that that gyroscopic disturbance that they always talk about, we can analogize that with, with weight there. But... One of the biggest things is is that we've got this lightsaber that's supposed to act a particular way, but it's actually more like a conventional stick. So we kind of have to move the things around and try to, you know, not only that, and I think the sounds, the lights, um, the, you know, all of this stuff goes into that. And the weapon, I think we can safely say all of us, is one of the things that we really, really love about this. <laughs> Well, just to mention something about the sounds right now, I mean, I don't really want to turn the conversation into sound fonts or anything like that, but I will say that, um, and I don't know how people feel about George Lucas, but I really like him. I think he's, he's, he's cool, and even though there's been a lot of hatred over the days and the years or whatever, I think he's an innovator, and uh, anyway, he would mention many, many, many times over, he said, these movies would never have worked without Benny and John. And, you know, he would talk about those in other times, too, and you'd get him quoting, saying, you know, I think 50% of Star Wars is the music and the sound. You know, a lot of times he'd be basically giving all that credit in those ways, and I think he's, he's absolutely right. I mean, I think half of the attraction, more than half of the attraction of the lightsaber props um, are the sound. In any movie, it's not just like, oh, well, you just say that because you do sound fonts and you're a lightsaber guy. I think it's like, no, look at any movie. Imagine watching, like uh, Flynn mentioned Serenity, which, by the way, I haven't seen much of. I don't, I don't really know anything about that. Imagine watching that without the sound. Uh, sorry, I'm so sorry, Flynn. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, right, like, there's a lot of films that you just couldn't watch without the sound, and most of them have to do with space and effects and kung fu stuff. But Imagine even, a kung fu fight but, without anything. It's ridiculous. Yes, but Imagine even that, even without... take any, any conventional sword fight. Take any conventional sword fight and take out all of the sword sounds that they're putting in there. Many of them aren't really realistic, like the shing and the in the way they, they, they sound and everything like that. Take all those they're sounds funny. out and, and watch how weird it looks. Yeah. It's just, what? I mean, sometimes it doesn't even look like you're hitting each other. I mean, hey, just to make a quick comment, have you guys ever seen stuff like horses? In Are the you watching movies? some of the fight? Oh, sorry, Craig. I was just going to say, have you guys like seen horses yeah. in the movies? Yes. Does anybody ever, like, have experience with real horses? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that ridiculous? Like, they usually, they're, like, standing there, and they'll be like, Woo! and you're like, they don't yeah. do that, just right, right. randomly. Yeah. So yes. It's, it's, but it's there because people, they, they need to hear it. It's something that, that brings it through for them. But anyway, keep going. Right. Like that ego and it goes, it goes along, right along with that illusion, right? With the, with the sound coming out of the saber um, is one thing. The light is another thing. But there's a difference here between weapons. And, you know, you go, you, you were mentioning there at the beginning, you, you know, coming from a phone. Why don't, uh, uh, Jared and Hugo probably could uh, uh, wax poetic on this because there's probably a, a lot of difference between the weapons that they're going from to, to, to sabers. I don't know. But, uh, uh, yeah, you want to... Jared, you go. J Jared, why don't you why don't you go Jared. first, and then you go. You can chime in. Uh, you mean like in terms of um, like the differences between going from uh, F F F F F F F or saber to lightsaber, right? Yeah. Well, oh, I mean, it's um, it's it's definitely kind of a jump. Uh, it, it people always, I mean, you, you can see here from the varied experiences that we all kind of bring to the table. Uh, people always take in what they what they know, and that's something that you know a few of us. Fencers have done uh, in terms of jumping from you know sport fencing to you know lightsaber combat because uh, it's definitely a, a new and unique weapon. But um, it, it's it's you know it takes a bit from each of the weapons, each of the three weapons in fencing. I, I like to think um, because they they each sort of have their own I, I, I guess applications. Uh, saber has um, the one of the unique things in saber. Uh, 
Matthew can definitely, uh, Novastar can talk to this, but uh, is the fact that you actually can cut to score a touch. Um, so that's definitely something that you have to take into account with a weapon that is pure energy and omnidirectional. Um, it's, it's an advantage that if you don't use, would be another waste. So uh, that's, that's definitely one major thing from Saber. Uh, versus Epe, which is a lot of people consider sort of more realistic um, in that it doesn't have any rules of right of way, like foil or saber or something like that. So it's pretty much, you know, kill or be killed. You know what I mean? You can score double touches. You can score, you know, it's pretty much the first one to stab the other guy wins. Full body target. Um, so in that way, it's it's a little more like a, I guess like maybe more like a real martial art, but it's, you know, definitely still a sport mindset and, you know, has its own limitations as, you know. But, uh... Jared makes an excellent point because with Epe, um, the goal would be you, you have to hit and not be hit if possible in order to advance your score and do well. However, if you both hit at the same time, you both score. So, for example, if Jared and I are fencing Epe and he lunges at me with a direct thrust and he doesn't do anything fancy, I lock the door out on his attack and also slide my weapon into place, closing the line and also hitting him. Now it's 1-0 in my favor. If Jared and I, from then on, double touch each other and keep murdering each other over and over and over until the match point is up, I win. But it's kind of a little stupid to do that, and I think even uh, Ugo would agree, you don't approach Epe fencing this way. You don't approach, really, foil fencing this way, and you don't approach saber fencing this way. It doesn't make any sense. Your goal is to hit and not be hit as much as possible, and, you know, strike the target and, and get out of line. You know, you're going to get double hits often. Jared knows this. Um, but it's never the intention, and you would never look at an epe fencer and, and say, oh, that guy, he just wanted to get one hit in and then double touch until the end of the bout. It's it's ridiculous, you know. Yeah, but the problem is, um, I think, uh, a little bit uh, a problem of convention. You have a uh, uh, paint and foil, uh, which are practically the same weapon, and you have uh, one of, one of the two, uh, which is uh, with which you can only hit by the tip, and the other also by the edge. But mm, what's the difference? Uh, it's a convention uh, in the in the uh, sports way. Uh, but I I totally agree with you. Because uh, I think my old master was uh, um, was very um, heretical when uh, he, uh, he he taught me that important wasn't to uh, to hit first, uh, but was uh, hit and not be hidden. And important in, is uh, to uh, to prevail, uh, not by um, whoever he is the first to to touch, because uh, it's not a win-win; it's a lose-lose. Uh, situation and I totally agree that it's uh, awkward to see and uh, I think this is one uh, difference uh, between uh, the real combat and the choreographics as uh, Chad said um, the problem is the audience Flynn said very very uh, well that um, when you have a, a movie with a fight inside you have to tell a story and all is uh, uh, focused on what the audience will, will will judge on me, on what I do, what my opponent do, what all the mm, uh, all the crew uh, and which is around me do. Uh, in the in a in a real fight, the audience is myself. The audience is my opponent. Uh, if me and you are fighting, we are uh, looking at ourselves and what we do. It's important what we do because we want to prevail, we want to uh, win. And so it's, it's very different. We, we do not, mm, I think, mm, in a real fight, uh, we do not uh, think, um, how do I look? <laughs> uh, I, probably, I probably am thinking, how can I hit my opponent? How can I prevail? How can I win without mm, get harmed, without get... Uh, Without mm, without problems, without troubles, without uh, bruises, <laughs> or can I can I run away, right? Yeah. But those are all really really good points, by the way. But, um, um, I, I would like to to start to the other point that uh, Chad uh, introduced uh, about the lightsaber. 
uh, what uh, changed in my life when I passed from uh, a foil, in my case, to a lightsaber. I found a totally different weapon. I found a weapon with a, a totally different uh, blade. I wasn't able to um, to have only a tip to to touch my opponent. I had an edge, but I didn't have an edge like a katana, like another kind of of, of swords, uh, in which I had one edge. If I uh, strike you uh, with a katana, with a boken, or with a, another kind of uh, of sword, uh, I have to touch you and then. Uh, get back and touch you in another position with the edge. With the lightsaber, I, it's all edge. I can make movements uh, unconceivable with other weapons. Flynn we would talk about that a lot, too. He would talk about how it is. It's, the, it's an edge. It's 360 degrees of a weapon. You know, it's yeah. pretty awesome. And it's very, it's, it's very interesting to develop, to try, to, to imagine and develop a, f uh, a fencing with uh, a weapon like this. It's very, it's very hard. It's very, it's very exciting. Uh, uh, but the, I think the uh, the point of start uh, is always the weapon you have. You can have, uh, uh, I think, twelve or twenty sword swords and uh, uh, think a different kind of, of of fencing, different kind of use of each one. You can't use a double hand. Uh, uh, sort of like you you use uh, an AP. Right. It's a different kind of. Those uh, are in different quarters, right? So, like, if you have a saber uh, a saber staff, we were just talking about yeah. this in class the other night. If you have a staff, you don't bring that into closed quarters. You bring a shorter weapon. You need to be able to get around your opponent as well as score that point. And also yeah. back to the katana and even the broadsword and even the the foil, if I'm not mistaken, it's just the tip is sharp, right? It's the uh, the. Yep. Is like just like a 12 inches or like a hand of the sharp. You can grab the blade. You can get behind a katana and yes. push into yeah. your. It's not right. with the last saber. With the it was your arm. Right. Right. With a, right. a yes. sword. Sorting, grab, all that grab that kind of stuff. Stuff. Get in there. It's a different weapon. There's yeah, also yeah. they also that, that, really too, that uh, you know with a lightsaber, and this is something that I actually like about the translation of maybe saber fencing to. Uh, lightsaber sparring is something that I like to do with the sparring workshop I did with Kane, you know, Mark Prater, um, is that, and I think Ugo would agree, but I guess it depends. I mean, there's a lot of lines of thinking, but any contact over zero pressure equals damage. You know what I mean? So it's, it's it, some people would often argue, oh, you hit me light, that doesn't count, that wouldn't do anything in a real fight. And I often even laugh at that because, for example, if you had a sword and you barely nicked my wrist. Um, last time I checked, there's a main artery uh, in there, so you could conceivably do some serious damage to me and render me completely useless if you sliced it and you, you barely cut me. You didn't have to hammer my arm off and murder me and be like, I'm Arnold Schwarzenegger, I destroy you. You know, you don't have to do this. Matthew, um, I make you an example to, to explain this better. Uh, we have a we have a blown in, in our sheet show. Uh, which is a, a touch uh, on the on the head, uh, and we do not uh, we, we do not need to to make a, a, a real strike like a like a hammer. Uh, we 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 need just a, a touch, a single touch, very 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 slight, because uh, it's a it's a lightsaber cut. It cuts everything, and so we don't need to to be very strong with our blows, uh, because we know that the weapon uh, practically. Cuts everything except itself. So we have a, a weapon which is uh, in our fiction uh, the only weapon you have and the only defense you have. Uh, so we have Paris and we have uh, some kinds of uh, of defenses which use only the lightsaber just to to be faithful to this fiction uh, we we had. Yeah. The, the, the convention we accept with the lightsaber is contact with the blade causes damage. Right. That's it. Yeah. Which removes. I mean. Yeah, a, a light scrape with a real sword in some spots can be damaging, but so much actual weapon-based martial arts involve getting your hand on your opponent's weapon. Yeah, and if th this is another thing I try to explain to a lot of people who take sword from me. It's not as easy to kill somebody with a sword as people like to think. I mean, people have seen lots of swordplay movies, but 
you know, go. There used to be machete fights on YouTube, and you can see the the amount. I mean, even if you get a lethal cut, sometimes it will take you hours to bleed out. So it's you're not gonna drop dead, right? So um, when we're dealing with blades, like he said. Especially when you're dealing, like we're coming from a more historical type of fencing, which is a little less sport. It we have, of course, rules for safety and all of that kind of thing, but we try to directly translate like stuff we find in manuals and and, and that kind of thing. But you'll notice that almost we do a lot of time in the bind, right? Especially with the two-handed weapons. And if you're dealing with 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 steel, you can grab the other person's weapon. You can take the other person's weapon away. These are opportunistic techniques which don't arise as much with a lightsaber because, well, you can't no touch touching, the blade. No <laughs> the blade. Yeah, it, one, of, one of the artifices of, of contemporary sport fencing, foil at base saber, um, is that, and, 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 or sport martial arts in general, is that neither person is really going to get killed or hurt. Um, so you there's there, there especially you know foil for instance with the uh, convention of right of way the rule of right of way that's designed to simulate the concept of if you were really fighting with a real you know a real period sword you're going to do everything you can to not get stabbed um, because again yes a light scrape you know it it, it it can do some damage especially going back historically now we're talking about uh, infection and sepsis mm -hmm. and all the horrible mm -hmm. things that come before modern medical technology. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably the biggest thing we did on the show with transferring these techniques to, to, to real stuff. So, hey, uh, like, from, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, there's a scene, uh, remember in the end of Gladiator, uh, where Russell Crowe, he gets into that lock with Joaquin, right, Joaquin Phoenix, right? Yeah. yeah. And, he, and he slowly turns over and dra just slowly jams that blade into him, right? You don't have to always do a quick swipe and whatever. If you're getting into a lock with somebody with a lightsaber, you grab the bottom of their pommel, and then you do the leverage over, that's one of the kills that we have in one of our, our choreographs. And it's like, it's a slow slash. Like you said, that presentation to the, to the audience, but... Right, I mean, didn't Blade the Samurai, right? they used to, didn't they used to lay the blade on people, and then that's the thing, you just draw the blade across, and I mean, they were razor sharp enough, so it's like, there's your damage. Um, so, sometimes, I mean, like with the long swords, they mo most ba combat weapons weren't really even that sharp. They're more for cleaving. Call, call, it's a, they weren't the especially a lot of the European weapons. They weren't cutting sh cutting like 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 razor sharp. They had more of a chisel edge because they were being designed to be used against various types of armor, and you don't want a really fine sharp edge, which will be a little more brittle and cause the weapon to to uh, degrade faster. You just needed something that would transfer all the kinetic energy into a very small area so you could direct that energy through the armor covering the person. Yeah, and I will say this, if we get back to the lightsabers here about the, the cutting through everything, I will submit this, and this is what I've been doing, is you will notice that in the, in the movies certain materials do provide some resistance to a lightsaber blade. They will ultimately cut it, but like cutting through doors and thick steel and, and, and that kind of stuff, there's, so, there's, sometimes there's some resistance there. So there is there's, there's a rationale for yeah. for doing the full... Yeah. For having, well, for having heating up and cutting, you've got to meet the boiling point of metal in order to get through it, right? So you've got that's your resistance, is how long yeah. is it going to take you to heat up your metal you're, you're cutting through? I mean, that, those little aluminum things that Vader and Luke were fighting around on Cloud City, he just go pew, right through it. But then right. that door that Liam Neeson was trying to get through, now you've got, like, you know, how many inches of whatever thick? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, I'd also just like to make a distinction between the, the fictional physics of a lightsaber and then just, like, the real-life physics of a lightsaber <laughs> that we use for yeah. our props. I mean, yeah, I, I totally understand, like, you know, the fictional physics, you want stuff to remain in the universe you know, to make it, you know, believable. Uh, but there are, like, practical considerations when it comes to a lightsaber. I mean, in all martial arts, like, the, the weapon will define the techniques that you'll end up using, and just some te techniques are inappropriate to use with a lightsaber because of these realities. One, a lot of lightsabers don't have hilts, right? So there's a lot, going to be a lot of, uh, you know, lock no, I think you mean guards. guards. Yeah. Cross guards. No cross yeah. No By the way, guards. really quick, I hate to interrupt this too, but I just have to say, you guys, Alan... Anonymous, Vornach, Craig, Flynn, Jared, 
And Ugo, I have to go. I have a Saber event I have to do, so peace out and have All fun right, with man. LED Sabers. Love you guys. Yeah, man. Thank you for being you. here. It was an honor. We'll talk to you later. And you as well. Alan, back to you. Back. I'm sorry. I'll, t I'll talk to you later, my man. Yeah, see you later, man. Bye. So, yeah, it does have a cross guard, right? It also, uh, you got to think about the Sabers themselves, the Saber blades. You know, they're polycarbonate, they're plastic, they're actually, you know, really slick. Uh, if you think about it, they like to glide across each other. So when it comes to some of the techniques too, you know, you have to be aware of like, oh wow, you know, it's actually, you know, uh, uh, Matt, you were, or was it Matthew? Um, you were saying that they're the the steel blades. You know, they have a little bit of grit on there, so you can have a bit of tension uh, when you're going across. You don't, you know, but with the epee, you can glisse. And I have to say, with with saber blades, the polycarbonate stuff, you can glisse very, very easily, which makes it really nice. But there was like a specific technique that you can apply. There are other things, though, like uh, I believe what uh, Flynn was saying earlier, just like you know, you can press down with a katana blade or other type of blades. You can't do it with a with a saber. The other thing about just like the practical reality about the saber is the weight and also just you know the the, the dimensions of the saber too. You know, usually you're going to have a really thick hilt. That you're holding in your hand, which makes it pretty cumbersome actually uh, to try to wield like one-handed, unless you get something really specialized. Another thing, if you have a lot of greeblies, I don't know if any of you have tried to use like a like a Vader saber or oh, one of the sabers that are canonical, and yeah, in a fight, oh my gosh, they like they cut you, they really cut you, and so that really yeah. like starts to uh, come into play when you're trying to use it during a performance. The types of techniques that you can use. I mean, there, you know, one could say there's a difference between the hero sabers and the stunt sabers, but those are other things that you have to take in consideration. And then last but not least is the, you know, the brightness of the blade. You, know, you have to think about the battery packs. You've got to think about the sound cards. All these things have to you know, really um, um, you know, be thought about well when you're doing a performance. I don't know how many times like, a saber might have shorted out in the middle of a performance, and that like, completely breaks the illusion of the fight. So there are these like practical considerations um, that will definitely change the techniques and the choreography that you're going to be using during the stuff. So I don't know. To me, um, even just going back to what we talked about earlier uh, about the difference between sparring and then doing choreography, it all really kind of boils down to what are the techniques that you're using that best, you know, sell what you're trying to do. So, you know, in the choreography, what are the techniques that you want to be selling to sell the story, you know, to also look very believable? Um, and then the other one, just, you know, if you're doing sparring, what are the techniques that you're doing there? And it can totally change, uh, you know, depending upon the kind of play that you're using, the saber that you're using. So, thank you. Yeah. And it's um, well, one of the other things about the, the saber blade that, that we have found from where we're coming from is the, the loss of a flat. Right, and we we tend to use the flat of the blade a lot um, in in parries and, and controls and, and stuff like that. It's useful for manipulating the other person, also for cha cha changing uh, changing who has that point of control when you're in the bind. And yeah, yeah. The the steel blades you you can have a little more grip than these when you're in the bind. It's mm -hmm. it, it changes how you manipulate. Yeah. The swords. Yeah, the bind is tricky, definitely with with these things, but. Uh, it can be done. We do it all the time. It's you have to get your angles right, and you have to, you know, you you have to be really, really good with the stuff. So I mean, some of these limitations, some of these differences, you know, between all that kind of stuff, actually turn to be real good learning tools. Yeah. You, you know, in that now, way. When you guys say the bind, do you mean like like sticky blade kind of thing? That's well. Or, is it, or the lock. Call that there, but anytime. I just want to know how you guys are defining it. We get in, in into here and do techniques where we're using the, the other person's pressure. So often we'll start out, we come in like that, and then you come in and try to do something like that. Um, it's 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 another one of the ranges that we use a lot of times in longsword. For two-handed weapons, it comes up a lot. We probably, um, we actually refer to that kind of like like sticky saber or lock or uh, or sticky leverage, you know. But it's, yeah, it's, great. it's and not so much along the blade that give you different leverages. It's like yes, your tip, yes, tip, yes. It's a little yeah, quicker. If you're really so in, then you can really start to dance together, you know. 
Right. It's not so much, yeah, because it's not so much a lock. Because when we when it happens in real combat, it happens extremely quickly. You know, boom, and it it can look like just a pass, like two people crash together, chop at each other madly with their swords, and then separate. It can look like that. Um, and with these, it goes really, really quick. What we were doing there was more that would, that would be more of like a, a training or teaching exercise right. to feel what it's like to be manipulating and manipulated. Right, yeah. It, so it, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it gets trickier with the with the round and slippery. <laughs> I, I got a, I got a quick question. Um, just I I, I just you know I, I have my techniques and things that I like to think about when preparing my saber. Do you, do you mind if like maybe you can go uh, around and like ask uh, the different people here like what are the sort of considerations that go goes into your saber? You know when you want to do a performance. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, or just in whatever you do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Why don't we Why don't we start with uh, you go over there? How about you? What What are you looking when you with your lightsaber? What's What's the thing with your lightsaber? That. Well, I can. Um, okay, tonight I I have with me now. All right. This is my own. Okay. This is um, and I think uh, it's really. I, I think that I agree as usual with uh, practically all of you with uh, uh, with with different matters that we have uh, we have talked about. And what I think what, when I use my my lightsaber is uh, is to find uh, okay I I have a I have taught a, a series of movements a series of uh, of approaches in uh, in different uh, styles and um, I'm, I I hope that Craig will. Will uh, enlighten our uh, our uh, symposium with uh, with this uh, uh, with this uh, wisdom uh, on uh, on the on the subject and uh, and so I have uh, uh, firstly an approach of uh, uh, practicity and Alan uh, firstly talk talk about it and uh, I I I think what is important to me to hit the body of my opponent uh, which is my first uh, concern and so I have to to find a way I have uh, a total body target so I I try to find uh, looking at what he's doing uh, what is uh, its approach uh, what is uh, its form uh, that is uh, carrying in, in the moment uh, he's fighting with me and I try to um, to beat him in when the time with the correct distance uh, with, uh, with with the current uh, with the uh, with a consistent technique uh, which um, brings me to uh, to go to my target and so uh, this is my first concern and uh, and after uh, it depends do you like my... do you like like um like a, you have a i think i recognize that saber there but do you like we have chokes like I have yeah. a choke on this, got two chokes yeah. on there, or whatever. Um, some people like chokes. What do you like? I actually mm. prefer a thicker handle, so I like the kind of MHS compatible stuff. What about you? Do you like a? Uh, well, I, I have to say that it, it's uh, it really depends from which form you want to use. Uh, I really find choke uh, useful, for instance, in makashi. Uh, sure. Or uh, or in Soresu. in uh, uh, in Shizu, I I'm more confident with uh, with other choke uh, with, um, with something more uh, uh, more with hard, us. not so not not so uh, flexible or um, I don't know. It's a feeling. Uh, it's a feeling when you when you have the hilt in your hand and uh, and you need a. Uh, uh, um, a movement which is faster uh, because you have to to do spins or uh, stuff like this, uh, this or a, if you if you need a, um, a strong uh, strike to to do and uh, or if you have to to make jumps or uh, uh, or something and so it, it, it's it's really different uh, um, depending from the style you're using. Uh, I personally prefer uh, chokes uh, for um, styles. I'm, I'm, uh, I uh, obviously love Makashi. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, 
uh, for uh, in the, obviously in the form we we in, in Ludusport developed. So uh, I have uh, I have my own preference, but I think sure. it's, it really depends on what kind of uh, combat or fight um, are we going to to do. Sure. How about you, Flynn? What? Tell us about your saber. Um, and then what went into it and everything. Well, uh, so Alan, your question was like when I'm considering a fight, like a choreographed fight, or like just the battle itself, like what we were just talking about with Hugo about um, different styles to different sabers, which uh, is or does it matter? Is you're asking us our different approach? Yeah, I, I was, I was getting into. Uh, yeah, I wanted to know like when you are picking out your saber. You know, what are the things that you are considering about it, you know, in terms of maybe saber length, whether it has a choke, you know, um, as it, you know, applies to then the type of choreography that you're trying to do. What are the considerations that go into the kind of saber that you're going to be using? Well, first of all, I mean, especially for a choreographed thing, is you're going to look at what the story entails. Um, if all of a sudden I'm going to be confronted by a double sabered Darth Maul type enemy, do I want two sabers, one in each hand, or do I want a full staff to battle him? How are we going to do this? What's the story going to play out? Do I know this guy from a, a different fight from previously? Did he kill my father? Should I prepare to die? You know, there's so much, you know, in the story that you could bring to that whole thing. But um, for me personally, like, uh, I mean, I came up with this design. I, I like the double choke system from uh, Custom Saber Shop. I got the, the back choke. I have the fore choke. And I'm always focusing around the balance point, which balances the polycarbonate blade against the entire weight of the saber, right? So that's, I mean, that's, my, I just use this saber. This is pretty much the only design I have. I have the silver one. I've got my, uh, my design, which is the Fwapper Ma graphics. It has, that looks like a, a Tibetan prayer wheel. I've actually got Tibet, uh, Omani Pod Mian engraved here. You can see the Foo Dogs from Kill Bill, right? So and here my my food dogs are guarding the temple, which is the lotus. So I mean, there's there's a story behind the lightsaber itself. I mean, you know, it's it wasn't crafted by my father, which now I have to go look for a six fingered man to go avenge. Is it? But there's a different story in there. So maybe when I'm picking out this saber, this is the one I'm going to use to kill that guy because of whatever revenge. But then you got another one with like a saber pike, where the handle is now three times as long and the blade is now shorter. You know, is this because I'm going to fight a guy who's got more of a Mongolian practice or a more of a medieval practice? Do I need to keep him at a long distance with that hardware? You know. What, what do you do with your second choke on your saber? Like, what kind of techniques play into that? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Actually, um, when I'm battling, like, let's say I'll be with somebody and then all of a sudden I want to do like a, an added huge flourish, then I'll let it slip out of my hand and I grab the ball joint. This is basically now a ball joint with a completely different method of movement. Now my entire arm is now like a tentacle and now the blade is almost like the stinger of a scorpion. You know, it's like, do I get you like that? Am I positioning with a Chinese position here to chamber and then strike. Now I've got an additional 12 inches on my strike with the tip of the blade getting even farther with my enemy farther away. And then I could bring it, whip it out, whip it around, and then cradle it in my arm. Now that's a fancy pose. You know, that's, that's what the, the rear bowl joint or the real choke gives me the advantage of that movement because now it's not only like an okay, like a choke in an okay, now it's like a ball joint in my shoulder. So it's kind of a different movement point. It's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Craig, how about you? Um, so kind of bouncing off of what Ugo was saying about um, his lightsabers, you're using the choke that helps uh, with his more fencing-oriented style. Uh, my style and the style of my character, ironically enough, is uh, more towards blunt force trauma and basically wide sweeping swaths. I, I refer, people refer to me as a bulldozer going like I I my preferred form both as a character both as you know um, a member of the community and as the character that I play is one she um, and uh, 
mild design, pretty much specifically for it. It's all handed. It is, there are no shirts. It may have a pretty solid grip for both hands. Um, it gives me great reach. Uh, I can, you know, pretty much, you know, this thing is a statement for me. This is, you know, um, I actually like the comment from Q in Skyfall when he hands James Bond his gun. Um, he goes less of a uh, less of a random killing tool and more of a personal statement. This um, this is basically my personal statement. I didn't want to go for shiny, flashy. I just wanted to go for this thing is going to be with me for a while. It is simple. It is basic. It does its job, and it does its job well. And I also it has a slight katana sort of uh, connotation with it. But also sort of a uh, a um, broadsword connotation. It's very much a double-handed weapon, and I definitely enjoy uh, some of the more uh, powerful strikes in my movements. So nice. All right, All right. Jack. Uh, well, or we can go with you here, or whatever. Um, we. <clears throat> I got. I I sometimes use the uh, the ascend from Genesis Custom Savers, but my, I would say my personal saber that is mine is what I call the Bride, the Bride of Frankenstick, but, um, so it's basically just an MHS kind of thing that I cobbled together from different parts and all kinds of different things, um, and I can switch out the LEDs and everything like that. Um, I, like I said, I like a thicker handle because I've got bigger hands, so it, it gives me a, a better feel. I kind of like grip over choke. Um, that gives me a, a better feeling contact with the, le with, with the weapon. Um, this is a pretty long weapon. Um, I'm used to weapons with long handles, so I like a longer handle. Um, I don't go for a choke, but I do like a bevel. Let's see if I can get it. How's that looking? Yeah. There you go. Okay, so I've got a little bevel right there so that I can grab on with my fingers and do essentially the same kind of thing, which uh, you would you would kind of do here with a conventional st sword with the pommel here. So as you can see, this if I compare the length of both of these handles, uh, the bride is even a little bit longer um, in the pommel, but. So there's that. Um, I do. I am trying to get into something where I can get a little bit of lip here, so you can get a little bit of guard action, a little bit of cross guard action. But we'll see. <laughs> you know. So that's kind of what I look for. I like a longer weapon. I like something with a little bit more weight. I like to have it balance out on the blade here, so it's more like a steel weapon, um, or in front of my hand, and that also helps me get power through. Uh, through my sins and allows me to kind of power it through there. How about you? Um, a lot of a lot of similar a lot of similar views to Chad. My 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 favorite hilt assembly I've ever seen is actually the hilt on these fetters. That's it's 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 really long. It's it's tapered. It has the ball at the end. It's it, that's my favorite hilt of any sort I've ever held. Um, for thicker lightsabers, uh, like uh, for people who are familiar with the Ultra Sabers, Dominics or Aeon, uh, an MHS compatible, I like the chokes because I have fairly short fingers. So I, I like the choke, which gives me a little bit more grip and control. Otherwise, uh, things like the Ascend and the Initiate, um, which are relatively narrow and do have contours, which allow me to keep a keep a better grip. Yeah. Allow, allow, allow me to, to manipulate and control the weapon a little better. Yeah. Um, I tend to like longer hilts just because most of what I'm sword work that I'm training in these days is long sword. But I've got background in other shorter weapons, and I do occasionally like a shorter hilt. Um, especially if I'm going to be doing any kind of double weapon work, I like to have uh, just separate weapon sizes. So I'll have a shorter one in one hand. And generally speaking, I like to have a shorter hilt for the shorter weapon as well. All right. Alan? Yeah, how about you, Alan? What, where, what, what are your points of view? This is awesome. Um, so I don't have uh, really the sabers, uh, the, my optimum saber, but I'll just show you a, a couple of sabers and like what I like about them and what I don't like. So here we have just like a basic um, ultra saber right here. I think this is uh, an initiate. 
Yeah, yeah that's the end. That's what uh, yeah. Matt was talking about. Yeah. So what I like about I I definitely like chokes um, right here. I like a really well balanced blade um, that is on the choke point for flourishes. So I guess you know I'm more of a suresu kind of style. I mean I I like to really make my um, performances a bit showy. I mean I I have this brilliant um, glowy stick and so and when you you know spin it around it looks really really cool and uh, having the choke. Um, at the fulcrum um, with my dominant hand makes those spins a lot easier and I can just have a lot more control and closer to my body. <laughs> um, the things that I don't like about this blade is one, it's, it's completely like chromed up and I find that um, during performances you know, you know you get nervous before a show, you get really sweaty you know and you're handling this thing and like oh gosh you know these things can get slippery really really quick and the worst thing that you can have is like you're doing a flourish or something like that, and all of a sudden the blade spins out of your hand. So I like to have a bit more grip here. I, I like the uh, powder coating that you see on uh, the Custom Saber Shop, just because they, you know it's uh, it's a little bit more texture around the grip section, you know, that you can apply to it um, and elsewhere. I also, um, uh, you know, you can check out the switch here. Here's like just a guarded um, latching <coughs> switch, switch right here. Which is pretty cool, um, but because it's not recessed, uh, you know, there's like good, good and bad things. One, these are plastic. You can already see that there's a chip in it from just where it got dropped in the ground, and also these plastic little greeblies things. If it, yeah, if it drops on the ground, it can like, you know, uh, damage. And then if you want to actually do some maintenance to the blade, these kinds of uh, buttons are really hard to remove. So I don't particularly like them, though I do like how it's guarded. Um, uh, I can show you another blade here. So this is uh, uh, another blade. Um, it's a, uh, a, a, a run of the Old Republic style sabers uh, that uh, was on FX sabers for a while. Really, really cool stuff. They have like these two uh, buttons right here. One of them is an auxiliary and the other one is the, uh, the, the switch that turns it on, uh, turns on the blade. And they're really nice too. And actually, if you can look a little closely, uh, we drilled in a little bit in there, so it's a little bit recessed. So I don't like, you know, if I hold it right here, it doesn't turn on. But and then I can like actually turn around here. And this is a nice little alternative too, because you can you can actually screw them off, and it's easy to maintain. At the same time, if I'm like holding it right here, and then my pinky is over the switch, this could be good or bad because then I can maybe accidentally turn off my blade if I'm doing some flourishes or something like that. Or I could turn it on too. So I saw that on Flynn's you had a little control box towards the end. That's a technique that people do so that you know if they're flourishing with their dominant hand up here, they can actually be you know let loose with, with their uh, rear grip and uh, you know they don't accidentally turn it on and off. That happens quite a bit. Um, I do like to have, you know, a some something to grab onto on the pommel as well. I like this sort of style. I saw a lot of people had like a larger pommel than this, where it's just flush. Because you find if you're going really, really fast, sometimes your hands will slip to the end, and you want to have just like something that you can hold onto, um, especially when you're going really, really fast. Uh, so those are the, some of the things that I kind of, you know, think about when designing my blade. Uh, I also like to have a little bit of uh, like windows in the, the 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 emitter section into the blade holder just because it looks really cool. And if it can have a crystal chamber that doesn't get in the way, those are some things I like to think about. This one doesn't have one. Uh, the other things I like to just make sure is that there isn't anything sharp on it. There's a lot of sabers out there that they look really cool because it has all these angles and sharp things to it. Like some Sethi sort of styles have claws on it on the on the on the that are coming out of the saber holder which looks really really cool and intimidating but in practice oh my gosh if you accidentally hit someone with those things you can really do some damage um, to a person so I'd really like recommend for people who are you know have a saber that has claws on it and are trying to do some fast-paced choreography or even sparring just take them off for the for the oh, yeah. team. For yeah. sparring, do not put those claws on because don't put we, the claws on. We yeah. they will bend 
almost immediately, and they be, quickly become a hazard. They'll be hanging off of your saber and everything like that, and you'll ruin them. So yeah. I, we've, we've tried it. We've, we've put them all through the, yeah. <laughs> through yeah. the bases. Yeah. I want to say something about the chokes, uh, because I noticed something about what Alan had said about how he holds the saber where his choke is. Now, when I hold my saber, my hand is always kind of like a little bit more forward on the emitter, which means, like, like, the reason why you have a choke, and Matthew, like you said before, because your fingers are a little smaller, it gives you a better grip to get around the circumference, right? So, but most people would actually put it in the crook of the first and second finger, like, you know, like you're doing an okay, and then have it spin around there. For me, I actually like to have that in the rear two fingers of my lock. So what I'm actually doing is, like, if you can see... Obi-Wan, where he's pointing his fingers, is like, that's where my saber is going to go. That's actually how I'm able to direct my saber on a number of strikes. Because I'm manipulating, I'm locked back here, but the first two fingers are actually allowing me to point, like, to disco. Like, wherever I want to disco, the point goes, right? You know, yeah, that's one of the reasons I don't, I don't much care for chokes a lot, is because when, when we're doing it, the... We'll do a spin off of all of the fingers, right? We might do it off of this one. We might do it off of this one. It all depends on the situation. So a choke kind of does lock you into a particular rotation. It's not as quite as easy if we take like the the ascend and the ascend. The one thing that we are always talking about is the the, the location of the switch. It's a great saber. It really is. It is I love it. Yeah. It's so it's so comfortable, except for the location of this stupid switch. It's right by your hand, and you will turn it off all the time. But it's a minor type of thing. What That's I did is I the back, yeah, it all the time. down. That's why yeah. mine's in the back, like uh, like Alan was saying. Yeah, it's primarily where why I designed it in the back. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. I, I would say that. Um. What, okay. Do you have something else to add? Okay. Alan? No? Sorry, can you hear me? Sorry. Nope, Alan, so, okay. yeah, one more thing that often gets overlooked um, is the blade, particularly the blade length themselves. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I actually enjoy a shorter length blade, um, something around 30 inches, and not something super long, because I find it easier to control and do spins, especially in tight places, and not really like uh, have to worry about accidentally hitting someone or... Uh, it knocking on the ground, or perhaps like if I'm doing a spin behind my back, that it's going to like hit the bottom of my back. So I was kind of wondering what lengths of blades that um, some of the other guests were using. Actually, and can why. I jump? I'm, I definitely have a we have a technique that we actually introduced because like the physics never lie, right? Um, basically, for my approach, the way I tell people to get comfortable with the proper length blade for their body is. Imagine that the edge of the emitter is going to be like, you know, you say, hey, rah, 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 you, know, you make your little mouth right here. From that point, when your arms are relaxed to your side, you measure from there to the little toe on the, on the foot on the same side of, as your, your arm. That should be, as far as mechanically, the, where the blade would lay. And then where, it's not so long where you skip the ground all the time. But it's not short where you like you have to get closer to your enemy in order to make that blade do what you needed to do. That's just a guideline that. Yeah, there's there's different ones like um, the the basic one that I've used from Chinese martial art is a regular one will come up to your navel, right here if you're standing shoulder width, and then for a long one, <clears throat> you want it to come up here closer to your sternum. Um, that's just a guideline. It, it, it really depends because, um, I, I, yeah, I know what you're talking about, Alan. I prefer, like, much longer blades, um, 40 yeah. inches, you know, preferably. Does that um, um, play into the kind of techniques that you use? And what, what kind of techniques are you using with the longer blade? Well, it's, pre it's pretty much the, it's, it's the, it's the longsword kind of mentality. So mine's Chinese longsword. That, that, that has types of things. So I do do some one-handed kind of things, but longsword techniques use a lot more leverage, so they, the rule of thumb is kind of an inch longer and an inch stronger. And plus, I wouldn't imagine you'd use a longsword on a, a form like Ataru, 
where you're all over the place, you're gymnastic, you'd probably want a shorter blade because that would, in a sense, uh, affect your turning and your torquing because that's, that's primarily the action of a taro, isn't it? Yeah, true, but I use I, I use the long blades for everything. Yeah, it's you you can you, when you practice with a weapon, you learn how to work with that weapon length. Um, I mean, the, the, one of the one of the guidelines for blade length that I know for a long weapon for a long sword is does the pommel come up to your armpit? That's about the right length. That's just I that's something I've heard. That's something I, I, I if it's somewhere in that range, that's a good length for me. For a single for a single handed sword, if you're if you're if you are standing in your fighting stance, you should be able to swing all the way around and have the sword not touch the ground. That's that's the length for the, for a single handed sword as a general guideline. But I use single handed swords with longer and shorter length blades. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> it all depends on what you do. As far as the Ataru thing, which which is interesting because that's that's something we didn't quite get to, but the whole realism of what each things because yeah Ataru does a lot of the spinning it's very very aggressive and that stuff actually translates to a longer blade too because it's heavier it has more inertia so you have to use more body and you have to you have to utilize those things maybe not in such a fantastic and you know Yoda-esque way but you still have to you have to get kind of more of your body between it with a longer heavier weapon um, and that's just because we're used to those yeah um, yeah. Oh, how about, yeah, let's continue on. Yeah. I got a question for you guys. What's what's the one unique thing about the lightsaber besides being made of light and whatever like that? What's the, I guess, the, the one fight technique that, can, that you can imply or employ, excuse me, um, with a blade, a saber blade that no other weapon can do? Mm. I think the thing, one thing that comes up often is that you can be a little sloppier with your technique than you would with a real sword because you have an omni omni cutting directional surface and you know un unlike with a staff which is also an omni striking surface but you need to have a certain amount of impact for it to be effective the convention of the lightsaber is any contact on on a, on a person is going to cause damage so yeah it's you you can you can get away with things that you wouldn't be able to using a regular sword yeah but actually that's an interesting thing you mentioned because i've actually thought about that question a lot i haven't found any techniques that you can that you can pull off that you can't do with any other weapon and i think one of the reasons for that is these weapons whether they be a lightsaber stick or sword are designed to work with our bodies, and our bodies only move a specific number of ways. So, where there may be some, uh, definitely some give and some some slop that's allowed, um, as far as edge position and, yeah. and, and all of that kind of thing, I haven't found anything terribly like whoa. I suppose it would render certain techniques effective that wouldn't be effective with a steel blade, like spinning it around your head like a helicopter, you wouldn't do anything with a real sword, but with a lightsaber, you could definitely screw a lot of people up. Yeah. So one, I guess that one, might be something. There's one that I found that no other, no other, except for maybe a, uh, a switchblade. Mm -hmm. The blade can go away. On, yeah. off. You know, yeah, you can be coming at somebody, yeah, so I don't have that. turn yours off, they fall by you, and then all of a sudden you're back on and striking them behind. You know what I mean? It's, you can turn off your blade. There's no, there will be nothing there, no magnetic force to go against, no steel to cut through. You turn it off and you just go buy it. Right. You know From I mean? our perspective at this point, that's just a theory because we can't do that with the tools that we have. Yeah, like I can't actually make this polycarbonate tube disappear and, and use it. Well, so it, it, it is a, it's, a, it's a fascinating concept and yeah. interesting to play with if we ever reach a point where we have a training tool that can do that. Yeah, like retractable blades. Yeah. That'd be sweet. That's okay. We'll fix it in post. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, right. one thing that um, um, I just find, and I don't know if you're talking just like the practical aspects of using a saber, but just in, in, the, in trying to keep it within the universe of Star Wars, it does, you know, allow you to do a lot of things that you normally couldn't get away with in, you know, a normal martial arts fight. You know, it's like the fantasy elements to it, right? You know, like what you're saying, um, you can turn the blade on and off. That's cool. Also, just like the fact that you're a Jedi or a Sith, you're using the Force, right? So there's a lot of things that you can sort of excuse 
because, oh, the person's using the force, so of course they can, like, flourish their blade around, you know, and block blaster bolts and all these other things, or, you know, do things that might normally, you know, would be really inefficient, but you can sort of excuse to say, like, well, they're using the force, and so they're, you know, they have this precognition about where the strikes are going to happen and all this other stuff so that you can, you know, get away with it. Um, right, yes, we yeah. don't have the force, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. But you, we do have the force in the sense that we can predict what the next action is going to be uh, if you're doing choreography, right? So you can kind of get away with this dance um, in a way that uh, that you that would probably be not so believable, right? If it was a, a different kind of fight, like if you're doing a street fight or something like that. Um, yeah. The other thing uh, that I that I like to see in, in in lightsaber fights is like when people use the force to pull the saber. So like the, you know the saber like um, we we've done, we've employed this in, in a couple of uh, choreography where a person gets disarmed and you know the the saber goes off stage and then all of a sudden the person reaches out you know with their hand and the saber like magically leaps back into their hand and able to you know continue the fight. And there's a lot of different, like, you know, sort of tricks that you can uh, achieve that illusion. But I like, I really like the sense that you can add illusion into a lightsaber fight that you normally wouldn't get away with. And, and in fact, that's something that um, uh, we've been talking about uh, at the Golden Eight Nights is, like, how can we add these, like, fun little gimmicks or illusions into our fights? Uh, one thing that uh, Nova and I did in our uh, fight at San Diego Comic-Con is we... Um, and actually, this didn't happen um, for, for reasons, but we had rehearsed it, and we were able to perform this in front of the rest of the group, and it looked really cool, is that we had a fake hand, right, um, that he had in his pocket. And so during one of our little lockups, and he was, like, wrestling with me and stuff, he managed to slip on the fake hand over his actual hand. And then I was disarmed at the time, and then what I did is that at, this, at the right moment, right, I reach out the saber, you know, gets pulled into my hand, and I turn around, and I chop off his hand, and his hand goes flying off into the crowd. It was amazing. It looked great. And, I mean, it was, it was kind of hokey, right? It was, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, this hand flies off and all this sort of stuff. But within the Star Wars universe, totally believable. And the people that were there to actually watch it were just, like, flipping their lid, right? Because this is, like, this, you know, quintessential moment within Star Wars when, you know, Luke gets his hand chopped off or Vader gets his hand chopped off. And so to kind of add that in, even if it was, like, a little funny, it was, like, a rubber hand and stuff, it was really, really cool. So I would like to say, like, you, you know, if you're doing your choreography and stuff, like, really take advantage that you're in this fictional universe with these magical forces that are, you know, afoot, and you can, you know, play around with that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to do one last thing here to wrap up because I think this is going to kind of come up to, to to what we're all kind of dancing around the subject here, and it'll relate to what you asked me here, Flynn. And what do you what can the lightsaber do that real swords can't? And this is probably the biggest thing for me, and that the lightsaber seems to be able better than way better than swords to bring people together. And what I mean is this. If I come here with this weapon into a room of normal, everyday, law-abiding citizens, and I do this, like that, in their company, <laughs> okay, people start to freak out, and the first question they're going to ask me is, is that sharp or is it real? Right? And the reason they do that is, of course, because they're afraid to get cut by it. Um, Watch out for the crazy guy with the razor blade. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so there's that. Now, conversely, if I take out a lightsaber and turn it on, right, completely the opposite reaction. Everybody wants to hold it. Everybody wants to t take it. And they're not going to ask me, is that real? Is it sharp or, or, or whatever? Is it going to hurt me? They're probably going to start quoting Star Wars or going boom, boom, boom in the air. Or can I doubt um, it? What? Or can I hold that? Oh my god, let me try that. Can I have that? Yeah, right, 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 exactly. So that's something you can't do with a sword. We, we like these martial arts because it, when you're in a martial art, you, you, you go to a dojo or you go to a school, you have your comrades, you have your brothers, your sisters, and you, there's a community there. And you'd like to make that bigger. That's what we've wanted to do for a very long time. 
and what Flynn did with New York Jedi back in the day, and what now is kind of burgeoning on what uh, Yudo is, Yugo is doing in Ludo Sport. I love the translation of the name now that I know what Ludo Sport means. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all of that um, is able to, I think, bring some of this stuff that's so useful that we love so much to people who would never have had it, whether it be fitness. I mean, I'm, I'm in to the fitness industry and to the human movement science and all that kind of stuff. So that's part of my, my concern is bringing fitness to people. How do you get people to work out? Hand them one of these. I'll bet you they'll work out for a long time without even knowing it. Yeah, more likely than if you handed them a broadsword or a long sword. <laughs> yes. And there's a, the, a, a, a real sword has appealed to some people. A lightsaber has appealed to a much broader swath of people. In, right. in, in the world. And I think because of this fantasy and reality thing. So why don't I just throw that out all to you guys. What are your thoughts on, on that kind of thing, on the, what we're doing here with the lightsaber and trying to, to, to create these communities and, and share in these fantasies? It's basically like shared dreaming. Um, so. Well, I think if, if, I can, if I can say something for... Uh, for first, and um, I was very, um, very touched by uh, the words of a martial arts, ma martial arts master who once said to our masters uh, who were looking for a confrontation in developing the techniques that we are now using. And this master uh, said to them that um, he was really amazed uh, by the fact that, in his opinion, the lightsaber was uh, probably the perfect sword. A sword that's so sacred that you can touch it, you can touch the blade. Uh, a weapon so, so, so perfect uh, that it cuts everything. It was uh, just like a, a dream for a sword master. Uh, in in this fiction, uh, in the in the idea, in the ideal that uh, that is uh, about the about the lightsaber, and about your um, uh, your point uh, about uh, what happens to me if I um, go uh, at the office with a real sword or with a lightsaber, and uh, it's obvious that the first uh, reaction uh, of me entering in the office with a with a real sword is whoa, what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, and the, and the, the reaction for me uh, entering with lightsaber, uh, where can I get one of these? Uh, what's the difference? Uh, I think the difference is in history. Uh, the sword has uh, has an history in uh, in in the mind of everyone, and so it, it's something mm, that uh, ring bells. Ring a lot of bells of, uh, of movies, of uh, books, of uh, um, of experience. Uh, lightsaber is uh, something new, something not so uh, part of the history, part of the uh, of the background. Uh, yeah, it's divorced from any one culture or anything like that. Yeah. And like you're, it, I like that. It's the perfect sword because it can represent what the sword represents, which is yeah. what, what it always has represented, which is that. Mastery yes, over oneself. I think that the the real point of the uh, the, the turning point can be uh, the fact that lightsaber it represents, as you say, uh, the perfect sword. So it can be the sword uh, 2.0 uh, in uh, <laughs> the history, if you if we can say so. Uh, and so I think it's it's important to uh, to. To keep talking about it, to keep um, practicing it, and and I think in with the time, uh, uh, lightsaber can be um, considered as a as a weapon, uh, as a, obviously a fictional weapon, but something uh, which is more than a toy, more than a collectible, more than something uh, fun or something linked to a fantasy world, uh, can be something uh, representing some something else, uh, which is a world of practicing, which is a world of sport, which is a world of uh, fantasy, uh, made reality. 
uh, or uh, uh, which is a world, uh, um, a world of study, a world of uh, um, um, a world of uh, um, practicing, uh, as I say, that uh, in uh, uh, in a way of which uh, uh, in a way in which uh, fantasy meets reality day by day. In every yeah. form uh, we can uh, we can have, in every approach we can use with it. Absolutely, absolutely, very well put, yeah. um, Flynn. How about you? Well, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you guys have known me for quite a while. I mean, I've been on the scene since. I mean, thank you, Chad. Yeah, you're right. I've been on the scene since the beginning. We were inspired by Ryan versus Dorkman or the fact that Master Replicas actually produced the FX savers that felt usable. I mean, I got into martial arts because I love the sword. There's something about the sword. And then, you know, Star Wars in 1977, you saw this call, this, this call to that warrior, that warrior's journey. Um, then, you know, you delve into a little bit more and you see the Joseph Campbell uh, with the archetypes and... and in, uh, the human journey about the the warrior falling from grace, recovering, overcoming the the evil or whatever it is. Uh, these are ingrained in our histories. I mean, we want to make sure that our children know the difference between right and wrong. You don't hold a sword and you don't attack somebody just to attack them. You attack you counterattack because they are causing damage to either your property, your loved ones, or killing, or whatever, and you counter strike until they stop. That's the point. You need to be able to rise to that occasion. You know, we're we're inspired by various things. You know, with this with this thing, um, like you said that like the sword, the, the lightsaber is different because it cuts through everything. Uh, and part of my traditional studies in meditation and understanding mental focus and the Boris religions and whatnot, my, one of my favorite deities in, in the Hindu mythologies uh, and Tibetan mythologies is Manjushri. Because in one hand he holds the book of knowledge and then in the other hand he holds the sword of discernment. So you cut through the BS and you see the real knowledge of the situation. When you're when you're confronted in a, in a moment where you have to wield a sword in order to overcome your opponent, you have to be aware, you have to be fluid, and you have to be confident. Because you show any weakness in any of that, you're going to be... You know, the part of that is dancing. Part of that is understanding why you're fighting. You know, where is this hero coming from? Where can you pull that strength from? With a sword, we're either scarring, we're sparring, or we're in... You know, um, I was, I, well, first of all, I was, I've been extremely blown away by the, the far reach that New York Jedi has had. With you guys out in, in Italy and then uh, Singapore, we had uh, as, uh, Asmi Demure and, and a whole bunch of other people around the world that this has really touched. And it all started with light. But I really realized that this really touches so many people on such a vast level. When I went home, to where I took my first karate lessons in my dojo back in the west town. And recently I went back with my lightsabers and I, and I, I asked him, uh, hey, I'm from New York and I'd love to give a lightsaber lesson. And they're like, oh, you mean like that poster we have on the wall over here? And I saw this advertisement for, for kids' lightsaber lessons. And I'm like, oh my god, you're kidding. How long have you guys been doing this? And they said, oh, well, we, we saw this group in New York. You probably know them, New York Jedi. And, you know, we were inspired to do it here. And I heard this, and I'm just like, all I can hear is Darth Vader in the back of my head saying, the circle is now complete. Because, <laughs> you know, where I got my lessons from, my inspiration was the Karate Kid. And I went and I found Karate. And then I went and I found Eskrima. And I always loved the Samurai. And then I went and found a Bushido instructor. And then Samurai Tate. And then all of a sudden the lightsabers came out. Now I had a library of knowledge to pull from in order to dance with this beautiful object that we've all been inspired by our entire lives. So I, I, I'm totally blown away by my humble participation in this being recognized. Thank you. Uh, and I'm, I look forward to seeing more from everybody because it's, it's so vast in our, in our culture. 
Um, but yeah, you're right. You can't walk into a place with a steel sword and have people be comfortable. Yeah. Unless you're at Comic Con. Uh, but lightsaber, everybody loves the lightsaber. Uh, it's. I ran into a, a married couple on the train. They were visiting New York City a couple of days ago, and they were, I was like, <laughs> see them both dressed up, and I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, oh, we're here celebrating our wedding. I'm like, oh, well, let's make this a New York moment. So I pull out the lightsabers, and she goes, are you the New York Jedi? <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> they were looking for us to actually take some classes. So you have no idea who you touch when you when like Jad when you put this stuff together. You're affecting more people than you know. We all have, and that's our humble service in this. We just give back to the universe what it's given us, Absolutely. and we get to dance a little more. You know, that's what that's what I love about this. And I, you know, thanks to everybody, really. Oh, absolutely. Thanks, all right, uh, Craig, you want to chime in on that one? Oh, he's muted again. <laughs> that's okay. I've seen it happen on. Okay. Big long Can you check one too? There we go. Okay. Right, we're back. Um, I, you guys, Ugo, um, Flynn, you guys are two tough facts to follow. Damn it. Um, <laughs> the lightsaber to me. You, you made him speechless. <laughs> yes. Take a note, guys. This doesn't happen much. Um, doesn't happen that often. The lightsaber? No, it doesn't. Um... He's been waiting five years for me to shut up. Um, <laughs> um, the lightsaber, no me, on top of what you go and Flynn have said, um, it's a bridge. It really is a bridge. I mean, we've seen it in New York Jedi. We've seen it here. Um, we've seen guys who have never held a sword before come in, look at the lightsaber, and they hook up with someone or some you know someone teaching a class. And suddenly now they are, you know, they're learning straight up martial arts. You have martial artists coming in, looking at the lightsaber and plying what they use, and teaching along. I mean, we mentioned, you know, our friend Jesse. Jesse is like a Swiss blade, you know, a Swiss Army knife of martial arts. I he's he knows more about martial arts than I think most of us have forgotten. Um, like he he knows several martial arts that even I have a hard time pronouncing. And he has plied his trade into this. And so is Flynn. So have I. So is, you know, pretty much everyone who's walked in has just either come in to learn something new, come in to teach something new, and to learn something new. And it's all because of this dinky little prop from what could have been a really you know, sci-fi movie in 1970s. You know, it's just like, it really, you know, what we uh, every so often in New York Jedi, we go, you know, we'll start off a conversation with, what is this? And, you know, sometimes the answer, the correct answer will be, it's a toy. Sometimes it'll be, you know, it's a, it's a weapon. Sometimes it'll be, it's a prop. Sometimes it'll be, it's an idea. We have put in a lot of, this is a lot of things. It can be a weapon. It can be a toy. It is a toy. It's a glorified flashlight, for God's sake. Um, but we are able to, through through the um, <laughs> through the benefit of silliness, kind of let go of our fears, let go of our um, inhibitions, and just go. This is something silly, you know. Really, what the hell is this going to ever teach me? And then, two, three years later, you are now um, writing documents on how to do the seven forms of lightsaber combat, or you're doing, you know, two-hour symposiums on, you know, on how to properly translate this. It's like after a while, you, you know, it starts, it starts to accumulate simply. But yeah, I, I know, I'm. I'm not trying to cover it up. Um, it's, uh, you know, this thing is really, ah, ah, it's bright, Flynn. Stop it. Um, but, uh, the lightsaber really, the lightsaber really is a bridge. And because it's silly, because it's a toy, because it's something that technically doesn't exist, people can just go, wait, you guys can do stuff with that? 
<laughs> I want to do that too. And then suddenly they find out, you know, like four years, they have some competency in 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 a weapon. That somehow part of it is really real because we've made it so. Yes. So I'll leave okay. it there. Okay. All right, Alan, want to bring us home on this one? Sure. Is there anything left to say? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, all our guests are, you know, really hit on a lot of the, the things that I feel are important um, that we bring as, uh, you know, a, a community um, to the world at large. So, I mean, just to kind of talk more about Star Wars and what it did is that, you know, we know it brought forward these um, archetypes in this new environment into this new setting that was a mixture of the, you know, romantic ideals of the medieval times with the, the futuristic sort of unknown, um, uh, you know, uh, that, that could conceivably happen within our time. Um, and I think, you know, Ugo said it really eloquently that, you know, of, of all the things within Star Wars, the lightsaber is, is perhaps the most iconic, um, uh, you know, emblem or the most iconic uh, element of it because it, it first it you know it, it is like the perfect sword right and so there is this idealism that goes into it um, it also it was earlier said that you know within the Star Wars stories the climax usually happens you know within the context of a lightsaber fight it's when the lightsabers are drawn that the final confrontation happens um, and there's also this um, this element that the, the saber or the sword is actually greater than a gun, right? So there is this sort of romantic idealism that this archaic weapon um, is somehow just, you know, better than, oh, you know, this point-and-click device that I can just indiscriminately kill. You know, that with a, with a saber, there's this intentionality behind it and a deep spiritual component. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I don't want to go too deep into spirituality within Star Wars, but you know, with, with talking about the Force and actually who wields the saber. Uh, the people who wield the saber are the people who are connected with this, you know, larger energy field that connects us all together. So when you, when you, when you bring out a saber, you know, all these things, whether consciously or unconsciously, you know, start to fire off in a person's head. They're like, wow, you know, this is, this is the moment, you know, this is the, this is, you know, whoever wields the lightsaber, it's kind of like Excalibur, right? Whoever wields a sword is the king of Britain. Whoever wields a lightsaber is like the master of the universe, right? So, you know, when, as a group, um, you know, the Golden Gate Knights, what we offer is this chance uh, for a person to kind of come into that role for the first time. And so there's this, uh, you know, sense of empowerment that happens with, you know, when, when a person... Uh, is given a lightsaber and then taught how to use it. You know, they, they get to step into that uh, heroic role um, that, you know, is completely inaccessible to them in normal everyday life. And yes, it's fantasy, but it, it, it's still, it's that, that, that wonder and that, um, uh, just that, you know, all those subconscious things that they've connected to, you know, when they first watched Star Wars, that makes it actually very real to them. Um, you know, I n never underestimate the power of role playing in shaping a person's outlook on life. Um, in fact, that's what a lot of kids do when they're younger. So, as a, as a group um, and, a, and a community at large, I think what we what we offer is uh, what we can give back to the community um, is that chance of empowerment. You know, through uh, you know first the fitness elements, you know, learning the techniques. Uh, a lot of people come to our class and they have no martial arts skills and like several months later you look at them and you're like, wow, that's really impressive. Uh, and then there's that the, the, the empowerment that one gets for adopting that heroic role. And then also the chance, you know, for those people to give back to the community through performances, through, um, you know, just uh, uh, trooping around, you know, going to children's hospitals, going into parades, performing in front of audiences, and kind of convey, you know, reconvey that sense of wonder and, and awe that a person might have first felt when they watched Star Wars in the first place. And so, I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we want to promote that culture, right? We want that heroic culture. And so we do it in a very tangible way um, that I think isn't too weird. You know, it's not... 
as weird as it is, <laughs> wielding around fake lightsabers, yeah. um, I think it's a very positive activity. It's a very positive, uh, 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 you know, uh, a type of hobby that a person can step into. Um, you know, it's it's also yeah. I, mean, I, have, I mean, Star Wars has a lot of broad appeal. I mean, people know Star Wars and they haven't even watched Star Wars. I mean, yeah. that is the power of it. So to to you know, kind of be able to tap into that and kind of um, uh, and also promote it and the the, the the moral lessons that are provided in there, um, I think is, is what we really try to kind of uh, kind of do. Um, yeah, and I, I think. The, oops, sorry. Oh yeah, just uh, I I think also just to kind of wrap it all up, um, the the saber inevitably involves choice. You know, uh, what you do with it is actually what defines you. Um, the choices that you make. I mean, that was the big, you know, kind of lesson in, in Star Wars is that, you know, you have, you can go good or evil and, you know, that is inevitably is what's going to define you in the end. Um, those, and, and, and can shape the fate of the cosmos at large. And for people to kind of really step into to think about, like, you know, what am I doing? Why am I here? Like, what is this all about? Um, even if it's in a sort of a fantasy setting, I think it's really, really powerful. Thank you. Yeah, and, and probably that's that's a good place to kind of bring everything here. We're kind of out of time here, but um, that, that's really what it comes down to is when we were kids, if for those of us who are old enough to remember Star Wars coming out, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, that was, it, it resonates with us in a personal way and all of this kind of stuff, but it also, like you were saying, it empowers people to, you know, shake off certain preconceptions and all that. And really what it comes down to is we want that world. We want a world where Jedi exist, where there is justice and order and all of this other stuff, because it doesn't really exist in our real world. It's what we make of it. And so we, as we do this and we build these communities and we do this, that's that's the hope, that we're, we're hoping that this will then turn into, it's like, yeah, okay, well now we're actually fighting with the lightsabers. Wouldn't it be great if we actually started living by these, by these ideals? And, you, you, can, you, can, you can help people touch something that may have been inspiring or fascinating to them and bring it into their everyday life. Absolutely. Chad, right. I, I really want to impart with, with everybody that was involved today, um, and I've seen a number of clubs come and go, and one of the main things that happens is that there becomes some kind of competitiveness that it's, um, you ever heard the old joke about uh, how many guitarists does it take to screw in a light bulb? About 25, but one to screw in a light bulb and 24 to turn around and say, yeah, I could do that, and I could do better. Yeah. You know? right. And it's, <clears throat> it's there's, it, what we are seeing now, what we, like, um, uh, well, when I, uh, several of you were uh, part of the Reclaiming the Blade Symposium that they had a little while ago. Like you said, Chad, we're bringing it into the real world. We're really doing this. This is us. We are the champions. And by Ludosport having their different locations uh, in Italy, right? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Uh, and then, like, are you guys all in California, Saber Wars trying to... Just tell everybody where you are if you want to spar, if you want a costume, if you want to do this, whatever. But it's all about the lightsaber. This has been, everybody is helping each other. We're all doing those four different levels, and we're all useful. You know, we're, we're all bringing this into a reality. And, Chad, thank you for setting up this because, you know, it's helping make that a reality, and it's, we're doing it. It's happening. Yes, absolutely. I agree. We, we want to build the community. Yep. And, you know, keep doing this stuff because... You know, we don't know who who else who is out there in some little dingy basement, right? That has the next great thing, right? But just needs an excuse to tell somebody. You know, that's always the question that I, I was asked this very very long when I was a child, and it's always bugged me. Like you can never tell who the best is because there always might be somebody better, and actually we now know there always is somebody better. So. We want to get as many people in this as, as 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 we can, definitely. And that's you know, here at TPLA, we're all open source. Take you know, please. We produce this stuff for people to use any way you want. Take it, mix it up, remix it, all that kind of thing. Um, 
Yeah, and that's that's really what we're all about. Well, how all, about after this? Yeah, the board. We uh, after we stop recording, let's all hang out for a second because there's some uh, some other activities going on that I'd love to talk with you guys about if we have. Oh, time. absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'll stick around here for there. So we'll just we'll uh, end the symposium for tonight. It was a great, great symposium. Hopefully, uh, we all enjoyed it. We had some questions. Well, we sort of had some questions coming on here through the thing, but we didn't quite get to them. We just had too many. <laughs> too, much, Great. too much to say. Too much to say. We're, we, we apologize for that, but that's okay. Um, please continue to ask questions to there. Connect with us on Saber Wars, on Saber Forum, FX Sabers, all these different outlets, Facebook. Facebook YouTube, Twitter. Yep. We're all out there. Um, so we'll go down the line here. Alan, Craig, Flynn, Hugo. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for everything that you're doing to, uh, and thank you for to uh, Nova Star who had to leave early, and to uh, Jared. Um, I know they had other plans that they had to go through. Thank you for making the time to even just spend a little bit of that. Your input was greatly appreciated. Um, thank you to everybody here and everybody out there that's helping make this a reality. So uh, if that's it for us, we will. Uh, See you next week, um, and from everybody here at TPLA, uh, may the force be with you, and happy sabering. Uh, may the force be with you, Tucha. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.